Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to Thought Leaders Series, Navigating PFAS, Contamination and Remediation. My name is Megan Purdy and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that today's webinar has been hosted with Engineers, Engineers Australia's industry partner, Fusca. Fusca Australia provides the Australasian region direct access to 162 years of proven geosynthetics, engineering, development, manufacturing, supply and installation experience. The highly dedicated local team refines 162 years of real-world universal geosynthetic experience and apply it to local conditions with millions of square metres of high quality materials applied across the Australasian region successfully. Husker Australia engineers project specific solutions for mining, roads and pavements, environmental and hydraulic engineering applications. Now today we will hear from our two speakers and that will then be followed by a live audience Q&A. So I encourage you all to please send your questions through to our speakers via the chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker for today, Boyd Ramsey. Boyd has been a leader with the, within the geosynthetic environmental containment and waste disposal industries for over three decades. He is an elected member of the Council of the International Geosynthetic Society, the co-chair of the International Geosynthetic Society Technical Committee on Barriers and chaired its Finance Committee. He is past chairman of both the Geosynthetic Materials Association and Geosynthetic Institute and is currently an independent consultant with a global client portfolio and the treasurer of the International Geosynthetics Society Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Boyd Ramsey. Good day. Uh, my name is Boyd Ramsey. Thank you for joining me for this presentation entitled PFAS, Containment, Regulation and Reality, Australia. Uh, I appreciate the nod from the folks at Engineers Australia, a uh, good organization. I've worked with you guys several times. Um, so happy to be here today and let's get started. Uh, start with a, an overview of what the presentation is going to be. We're going to talk a little bit about toxicity. Um, we're going to talk much about concentrations, um, regulatory and social landscape in Australia with a little bit of touching on the rest of the world and then talk about containment to fast geosynthetic products, uh, evaluation and testing of those, and I'll make some recommendations to you at the end. Uh, but we're going to start with some caveats and disclosures. Uh, this is my opinion and my opinion solely. Um, I run a private independent consultancy. Um, I've done a lot of work for various industry groups serving in leadership positions, um, but this is not the opinion of the International Geosynthetic Society or any of the other groups I've led. Uh, this is my opinion solely. Um, the basis for my expertise as a quote unquote thought leader, uh, which really surprised me, that's the first time anybody's called me that, uh, is a 25 year career with a the world's largest geosynthetic manufacturer. Um, I've held multiple positions, as I mentioned, within the Inter International Geosynthetic Society or IGS is the, known by its acronym. Um, including the founding chairman of the Technical Committee on Barrier Systems. Um, and barriers for PFAS is what we're going to talk about today. Um, specific to Australia, I was involved in a PFAS consultation project with Southern Waste, Southern Waste Resource Co. Uh, a site outside of Adelaide, they were trying to get a PFAS cell permitted. Um, and that response uh, was unfortunately negative um, for reasons that I'll illustrate during the presentation. Um, but I've worked with PFAS in Australia for many years, and I think I have a, a very good understanding of the situation there. Uh, something unusual on the, the caveats and disclosures, uh, this, tie, this section relationship to the general public, um, and it relates specifically to PFAS. Um, there are people who have been negatively affected by PFAS through absolutely no fault of their own. 
Um, and it's something we need to consider when we're discussing the, the situation and the regulations and how you handle this stuff. Um, so it's fairly complicated. Um, one of my favorite quotes, I, I love quotations and aphorisms. One of my favorite quotes is, sign of intelligence of a, of a true intelligent man is the, or woman is the ability to keep two separate thoughts in their mind at the same time and still function. Um, and PFAS is very much that consideration. There are shades of gray. You talk about concentration and remediation, and, and we'll, we'll touch on that detail in depth. Um, but I want to give a brief example for starters. Uh, these are the folks at Songbird Farms. Uh, it's a small organic farm in Maine. Um, they started a, a small, small homegrown operation, mom, dad, and baby there. Um, and they were doing very well until unfortunately the products they sold, the food and the nourishment were tested positively for PFAS. Uh, this was through no fault of their own. Many years before they bought the property, uh, it had been sprayed with biosolids from the local wastewater treatment plant as fertilization. Um, and this is a common practice around the world. Uh, well, the PFAS was in the biosolids and unfortunately it's still, it was still there. Um, which leads to the name of PFAS, which is Forever Chemicals. Um, these products are, are very persistent in the environment. Um, they are not affected by solar radiation, um, and they last a real long time. I was educated as a chemist, and this is not a real surprise. Uh, there are parallels with a lot of other similarly structured and similarly shaped products. CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons that cause ozone depletion. Uh, you Australians are well aware of that. Um, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, these are great electrical insulators, but they unfortunately contaminated Love Canal in New York to the point where it had to be abandoned. Um, so there's this type of chemical that the human society has created and had bad experiences with before, uh, multi-halogenated materials. Um, and PFAS is a little unique because it's completely halogenated and thus very, very unreactive. Um, however, PFAS is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. It's in nonstick cookware, waterproof clothing, carpeting, firefighting foams, cosmetics, shoes, um, everywhere, including the soil extracted from the Melbourne Wastegate Tunnel Metro expansion. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly. And the health effects from PFAS and, and these sorts of things are certainly negative, uh, but I will say that they are not completely understood. First off, a little definition on what PFAS is. It actually covers a range of chemical structures. Um, I'm not going to go into that detail, but I recommend this paper by Buck. Um, it's, it's a little long in the tooth, but does a good job of uh, clarifying exactly what these products are, terminology, origins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, So again, I, I mentioned the, the chemical structure. As a chemist, we use the periodic table, which everybody's probably heard of, but is not intimately familiar with. Um, and you see fluorine is element number nine. Um, all the other nasty stuff I mentioned is in that column, uh, chem chemicals called halogens. Um, and as you go up and down those columns, things become more reactive, less reactive, more toxic, less toxic. Um, and PFAS is generally completely fluorinated organic chains. Um, I mentioned it's everywhere. So let's talk about PFAS and shoes. Um, my father sold shoes when I was growing up, so it's an easy combination for me, but probably a bit of a weird one for you guys. Um, specifically, let's talk about the brand Hush Puppies. Um, they were very popular when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, uh, and they were water repellent and easy to clean. Um, and you see on the, the screen an, an in shot of what that looks like, um, wiping away the, the water that ha has beaded up on the outside of the leather shoe. Um, the reason that that occurs is that shoe is chock full of PFAS, at least chock full relative to the concentrations that we're talking about regulating now. Uh, they were very re water repellent, um, but unfortunately, as, as we'll come back to later in the presentation, uh, PFAS contamination was prevalent in that particular city, manufacturing plant, county, et cetera. So I mentioned concentrations. Uh, it's important for us to understand the concentration levels of PFAS that we're dealing with 
relative to <clears throat> other experiences we've had. So a typical leaking underground storage tank has a fairly low level in the 7,000 ppm range uh, for parts per million requiring action. Uh, I mentioned the, the Hush Puppy place. Those were made at the Wolverine Tannery. Uh, they have a PFAS contamination soil level of about 500,000 parts per million. Clearly something very, very bad. Uh, we're regulating PFAS at a much, much different level. Uh, you see the number there, 270 parts per trillion. A guideline value for surface water action, and there's different values for different, you know, drinking water or fish or nourishment, et cetera. Um, but we're they're in that range of parts per trillion. Uh, so I include these sentences in red because it's very important to understand the difference in orders of magnitude of regulatory action now versus the way we treat. PCBs, leaking underground storage tanks, et cetera, et cetera, what, what I'm going to call the normal components. So you, I'll, I, you can read the numbers, but I emphasize that we are trying to regulate at the parts per trillion level. 270 parts per trillion is four minutes in a period of 31,708 years. That's a very, very different level than we regulate everything else. Uh, and it guides some of the decisions we make. Um, and this is the other part of those two, two opposing thoughts in your mind that I spoke at about at the beginning of this presentation. These people were clearly harmed in Maine. They lost their farm that lost great value. And there's many people around the world and in Australia uh, who have you know, not only had physical illness, but economic impact. Uh, there's all sorts of problems with PFAS. Um, so we've regulated it in a way that's very, very different than we've regulated anything else. Uh, and we, we need to keep that thought in mind. I, I feel bad for the people in Maine, um, but remediation of their farm is not practical, but we'll get to that. So the biggest source of PFAS contamination generally comes from military sites and airports where they did firefighting training. Uh, P4, PFAS is present in something called AFF, anti-firefighting foam. Um, and you see the guy here spraying the hose with PFAS containing li liquid. Um, and it's a great flame suppressant. Um, you know, it, it, it's chemically unreactive. It has no oxygen in it, so it doesn't burn or oxidize. Um, it's a wonderful suppressant. Um, but we've used it at these facilities time and time again. You know, every every Saturday, all the firefighters go out there and they practice and do what they're supposed to do uh, so they can help us in times of emergency. Uh, but there's a huge difference between what's happening to that guy holding that hose and what's happening to a person wearing a pair of hush puppies for a few years. So again, I've, I've spent a little time on this, but it's important to understand that these differences in regulatory effort and containment effort and action uh, contamination rates are huge. They're, they're very different than what we've done in the past. So when you have something that's, that's bad um, and you really want to control it differently than you've ever controlled it before, first question that pops up to the mind is how much is there? Um, so you see on your slide a title of a report um, that's actually several years old um, that estimated a global worship, global emissions inventory of PFAS um, and not only estimated it but went forward and estimated how much there might be in the future. So this is a, a chart taken from that paper um, and it proposes two scenarios. The scenario on the left is that we do with PFAS what we did with fluorofluorocarbons in the ozone layer, which is essentially globally stop making it. Uh, and if that projection had been occurred, uh, we would have been making still a little bit because there's some medical applications and, and there are applications where PFAS is necessary and has to be used um, in order to protect human health and safety. Uh, but they're not very many, uh, not nearly as ubiquitous as it's being used today. So if we'd followed the, the ozone depletion route and stopped making it, um, we would have been almost out of this problem, at least the, the creation of a bigger problem by now. Uh, but we didn't do that. Uh, 
uh, we continued to make it. So we're somewhere in the range of the right-hand column, probably a little below that, uh, where we have continued to manufacture this product in massive quantities. Uh, you see the numbers there, the scale is tons per year. So when you want to regulate something at the parts per trillion level, it's probably not a good idea to make 200, 300, 400 tons of this every year and put it in all these types of products. Um, it's just extremely inconsistent and doesn't work. So a couple more words about toxicity. Um, clearly, this is a problem. Um, it's a bad material. Um, Sutherland does a, a paper that I want to quote here because I don't want you le leaving this presentation me with me giving you the impression that PFAS isn't bad. It is. Uh, they started a study and they were giving a dosage to rhesus monkeys, uh, which are very similar in human structure and physiology to us. Um, and at the PFAS levels they were giving them initially, all the monkeys died after 20 days. And the study had to be aborted. They went back in, gave them lower doses of PFAS, um, and that resulted in other problems um, immune system issues, decreased liver rate. Um, so PFAS is not a good thing. Um, I don't want you to leave with that impression. I also want to leave you with the, uh, with the caveat that I'm not a medical doctor. This is not my principal area of expertise. There's other people that know a hell of a lot more about the interfa interface of PFAS and human physiology than I do. So let's shift and talk about Australian regulatory landscape. Um, you know, it's been active in the Australian Social Society as well, uh, but there have been a whole lot of lawsuits filed, uh, both individual and class action lawsuits. Um, and I'll touch on some of that. We'll talk about the media attention. Um, you guys are, are actually ahead of the game in that there's an environmental management plan for PFAS. Uh, the current plan is 2.0, 3.0 is under consideration. Um, I've actually made public comments relative to that. Um, and then I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Westgate Tunnel uh, fiasco, and I use that word specifically. Um, so in the legal environment side, uh, you guys received a visit by an attorney named Erin Brockovich. Um, you've probably heard that name in connection with a movie. Uh, she was a key and critical figure uh, in holding a California utility um, a, responsible for the environmental contamination that they were doing and the cancer that they were promoting in the people who lived around their facilities. She came down to Australia, got involved in PFAS, filed, filed multiple class action suits, uh, some of which are settled already, but some of which are still ongoing. Um, so there's, there's active PFAS litigation in Australia. Uh, it's also been present in entertainment. Uh, there's a movie called Dark Waters. Uh, the principal figure there is a farmer who had a bunch of cows killed. He lived downstream from a PFAS manufacturing facility. Um, and it was also popularized on a, a John Oliver last week with John, last week tonight with John Oliver HBO program. Um, and that's available on YouTube if you want to go see it. As I mentioned, you guys have guidelines. Uh, version two is dated January 2020. Um, and it's a pretty comprehensive guideline on what to do about PFAS. And I, I applaud the regulators. They did a very good job with it, uh, considering how difficult this problem is, given the discrepancy between the ubiquitousness of the material and the issue of, of health and safety for humans. Uh, you are working on a new plan. Uh, plan three is coming up fairly shortly. I mentioned public containment. Uh, excuse me, I mentioned public comment that I made. Um, and there's a link down there where you can go and, and the public comment period is closed, but you can see what's going on and that'll connect you with the issue. I've mentioned the Westgate Tunnel issue and called it a fiasco. It absolutely was. Uh, they were in the process of building a metro tunnel and they discovered that their spoils, what they were, the, the drilling solids that they were taking out of the tunnel uh, were contaminated with PFAS. Um, that essentially shut that project down for more than a year uh, because it was improperly managed and not so much from a PFAS situation, but from a, a public relations situation. Uh, here's a couple quotes from the Ombudsman report. Uh, 
which I strongly recommend if you're going to work with PFAS, you get a hold of a copy of that and read it. It will be a very good educational experience with you. Uh, but essentially, the people operating the project didn't do a good job of communicating to the community, uh, nor did the EPA. Um, and as a result, the community rose up in a, a not in my backyard or, or NIMBY uh, type action and said, no, we, we don't want PFAS anywhere around this. Uh, so it, public, public relationships have to be managed. And that was something I learned in my work with the uh, site down in Adelaide, although I've learned that lesson several times. It's, it's difficult to do, but it's essential because people read headlines about this stuff in the newspaper and are legitimately concerned. So with all those problems, why would you want anything to do with this? Um, and this gets to the, the next portion of my presentation. Um, there's a good reason for to do this, besides the fact that engineers are tasked with making the world a better place. Um, the geosynthetics industry has the proper tools to address this issue. Um, and there are a large number of locations that should be managed and contamination effects mitigated. Um, and basically, as I mentioned previously, these are, these are airports and military sites where they've done firefighting foam treating. Um, those sites need to be mitigated, regardless whether the regulations come out parts per trillion, parts per billion, parts per million. Um, those sites have severe contamination and should be managed. Uh, now, there's, there's one way to manage them with capping, uh, and I'm a big fan of capping, uh, although I have to admit the bias from my industry, my material, the materials I work with supply materials for capping. Uh, but it is not remediation, and people don't like it because they want things to be returned to their clean, pristine state. Um, and capping is essentially like an umbrella. Uh, you put a, a liner or preferably a composite liner over the material uh, and then you prevent rainfall and water integration into it. And the problem isn't solved, but it certainly diminishes and it doesn't spread or get any bigger. Uh, so that's an important and, and valuable technique that I think is underutilized. So I use the word composite liner um, and I'm going to spend a couple, se a couple minutes on that concept. Um, it is a two-component system, normally a geomembrane or plastic sheet to the uninitiated, um, and a clay or GCL liner or a composite liner. Um, you might control liquid head above the barrier. That's a good thing to do. Uh, but these composite liners work really, really well. Um, one plus one really equals three here. Uh, but you're using a two-component system, and that two-component system is important. Um, you have the geomembrane, and people say, oh, well, I'll just put this giant plastic geomembrane over it, and okay. Uh, that's not necessarily a good idea. You see in the picture on the right a hole in the geomembrane. I took that picture from a site that had severe leakage. Um, and engineers, being a conservative bunch, should always plan for there being a hole in the geomembrane. And what the composite system does is help you manage any liquid that goes through the hole in the geomembrane. So, Here's a graph taken from the, an EPA report that basically proves that. Um, this is a graph of landfill leakage. It compares different systems. Uh, the yellow line is a geomembrane alone. Uh, the red line, the best system, is a geomembrane with a geocomposite GCL product. Um, leakage rate is listed in the, the y-axis, and it's measured through all of the phases of landfill operation, even after final cover has been placed and the landfill is quote unquote closed. Um, so you see these products work, uh, particularly when used in, in combination one with another. Uh, and we've got a long history of doing that in landfills and, and containment sites around the world, not only for, for municipal waste, but for hazardous waste um, and all of the, the PFAS type thing. So returning to Australia, um, you guys have a little bit of, of experience with this. I'm sure you've read about it in your newspapers, et cetera. Um, this is a picture of Friends of the Earth from Friends of the Earth Australia that shows contaminated sites. Uh, this is probably not current as, as they're discovering new sites all the time. Uh, but it's something that Australia has to deal with as well as the rest of the world. So. I've talked a little bit about the containment tools for geosynthetics. Let me move to a few comments on evaluation and testing. Um, if you have more questions, which I expect you will after my presentation, I would suggest you contact me or, or hire me to help you with your problem. 
um, because geosynthetics and PFAS, you know, P PFAS is a relatively new problem um, and geosynthetics and how they work are relatively new solutions related to PFAS. So we've done a lot of testing. Um, this is a, a paper by De Batista uh, testing the permittivity of PFAS through polyethylene geomembranes, uh, which is an important consideration. Um, and I have a, a whole other presentation I could do on this aspect of it. Uh, but I mentioned again, the composite liners, uh, you have your, your two systems and one system is designed to manage the PFAS and absorb the PFAS should it leak through a geomembrane. Uh, and that second component, capturing the PFAS that has leaked through the geomembrane, is what I'm essentially teeing up my, uh, my co-followers presentation for, uh, Gus Martin with Husker. Uh, Husker and other companies, but, but Husker certainly led the field in this, um, have created products that will absorb PFAS in a composite system and are, are in fact designed to do so. And in my opinion, as of today, this is best practice. So again, no detail, but a couple considerations. When you absorb PFAS, what you're interested in is how much can I absorb? How fast can I absorb it? And how long will I retain it? A uh, critical issue that some people you know, lose, you know, activated carbons will absorb a lot of materials, but then over time they will re-release them into the, into the environment. And that's not a good thing. Um, just a quick shot here of a breakthrough curve. Um, this is a, a CFC absorption on an activated carbon bed, um, and you see the axis of, of when it breaks through. Uh, this is in terms of minutes, but testing has been done on, on PFAS with the new geosynthetic products, and, and they work in terms of months, days, years, and, and even now we're into projection of decades by doing some elevated testing. So again, I mentioned remediation. Um, the structure of PFAS, which gives it its properties is it's extremely unreactive chemically um, and that makes it hard to remediate it. Uh, thus the remediation is very expensive. Um, there are multiple techniques and, and different options give different results. Uh, but given the current regulatory guidelines, parts per trillion containment level, I don't believe remediation to be economically feasible. Um, and I also don't believe it to be justified by what is known about PFAS toxicity. Um, again, two competing ideas in my head. I feel bad for those people in Maine, um, but there's no way to justify going in and trying to take the PFAS out of their fields. That is just not practical. So what do I think should happen? Um, I think that most PFAS sites should be capped to prevent water intrusion uh, and expansion of the contamination footprint. Uh, geosynthetics offer a proven and evaluated tool for PFAS containment. So you've got a tool in your toolbox that works. Um, again, here, various options give various results. Uh, people are talking about using double line systems uh, or belt and suspenders type containment. Um, but it's a, 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 an existing tool that you guys as engineers can use. Uh, my kind of closing opinion here, at the current regulatory guideline levels, low-level contaminated sites may not merit efforts and investment based on what's known about PFAS toxicity. You know, it, it's not like a, a tiny molecule of this is going to kill us. Uh, it's everywhere and found in the blood of most human beings around the globe. Um, it's not good for you, but it's not plutonium either. Um, so regulatory agencies and engineers with specific site knowledge should be making these determinations about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. So in conclusion, uh, geosynthetics provide tools for PFAS containment. Uh, these are effective at containing PFAS at normal levels, normal being the things we're associated with, PCBs, uh, other types of organic and inorganic contaminants. Um, and they are perhaps working for levels consistent with the proposed regulations. Um, again, you should have more discussions and talk about testing levels in your specific situation. Uh, but the geosynthetic barriers work very, very well. Uh, you need to keep in mind that there are legal and regulatory and stakeholder interests, um, and these demand attention. Uh, 
Um, I would advise a best practice approach to belt and suspenders, particularly in the current legal environment. Uh, people are suing each other about this. Um, and as always, the use of experienced companies and staff uh, are important, um, particularly in critical applications. Uh, it's important to use people who know what they're doing and have done this previously or, or similar applications. So there's a set of references available. I've sent those through to Engineers Australia. Um, if you'd like to see the list of papers that support these opinions, I've got about two pages of them. Um, and they, they may make a useful tool for somebody. Um, again, my name is Boyd Ramsey. Um, I'm with Boyd Ramsey Consulting. Thank you for listening. And if you need me, you can find me on the web and I'd be happy to talk with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Boyd, for your input today. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Gus Martins. Gus is a seasoned Director of Operations and Engineering with a wealth of experience in civil engineering, particularly in environmental and hydraulic projects. With a strong background in geosynthetic product development, Gus consistently surpasses client expectations. Currently pursuing a PhD at Monash University, his research centres on sustainable solutions using geocomposites for emerging contaminants. A skilled leader, Gus ensures quality and efficiency in complex projects, making him an invaluable asset for organisations striving for excellence in engineering and operations. Please join me in welcoming Gus Martins. Well, thank you all for joining us today on this second session where we'll give some continuity into Boyd's presentation. And we will be talking a little bit more about how geosynthetics can be used for PFAS remediation. There are some interesting technologies uh, out there, but the main message that we want to achieve today is how can we use contaminated soil instead of having to transport or and disposal or thermal destruction or take it to a different area? This is the main point that we want to cover today. As Boyd mentioned, we had a spike recently on the number of contaminated soil with PFAS uh, rising through the media and to several other uh, uh, political issues. One of the main uh, sources of PFAS contaminated material came through the West Gate Tunnel here in Victoria, which caused a massive spike on the quantities of tonne of soil being taken for disposal. Uh, the main problem in this area, in this particular project, uh, was in, in Cood Island in the north region of the CBD in Melbourne, where we had a massive fire erupting almost uh, more than 20 years ago in 1991. So this caused um, a massive problem, of course, not only the fumes and all the, the hazard that could potentially uh, be coming from the fire, but also the firefighter had to use a foam uh, that was heavily contaminated with PFAS to uh, fight the blaze. And afterwards, uh, when we start doing the project in West Cape Tunnel, we start finding a lot of contamination on the soil surrounding these areas. The important part on this is how we're going to deal with these soils that are contaminated with PFAS. Uh, if we look into all the hazard waste that we had here in Australia and try to understand better how can we treat and how we deal with each contaminants, and we separate them just looking into the PFAS contaminated material and the soil contaminated, we can see that the vast majority is taken for landfill disposal, which of course impacts a lot uh, the CO2 emissions in the country and the cost uh, for all this disposal of materials. If we look into the quantities, uh, PFAS contaminated soil is still a very small part of all the hazard waste created in Australia. So if we compare all the contaminated soil that we had in Australia, PFAS it's only 10,000 uh, tons. So it's a small fraction, but the problem is how we deal with this material uh, and where can we take it. Recently we had in Victoria three landfills that were accepted, uh, were receive the credentials to receive contaminated waste with contaminated uh, PFAS contaminated waste and what we found is the concentrations need to be ideal to be uh, uh, feasible to be taken for landfill so current regulations on APA and NEMP uh, as Boyd mentioned 
are extremely low in the order of 0.7 micrograms per liter for the leachate in PFOS in PFHSS uh, sum. So this makes harder for us to dispose of contaminated soil on landfill. It's not all applications or all phases that we will be able to dispose of land, uh, soil contaminated in landfill. But the main problem is the current uh, layout that we have on landfills using uh, geosynthetics as a bottom liner, for example, on geomembranes and uh, geosynthetic lead liners, uh, is that this design, the original design for length fuse, was not created to receive PFAS contamin contaminated material. And once we start looking more deeply into this context, we have recent studies looking into how PFAS would diffuse through geomembranes. So this is a very a nice example uh, where they used LDPE, um, a very thin sheet of geomembrane. So we have 0.75 mil uh, geomembrane force it uh, until we have a breakthrough through diffusion um, for, for PFOA and PFOS. So we can easily see that after a little bit more than a year, we start to have some breakthrough uh, by diffusion through the geomembrane. So essentially, the current layout, the current technologies that we have for length fuse, is not ideal for the control of PFAS contaminated leaching. But also on the same side, uh, there are a lot of different types of geosynthetics being used on landfills, not only geomembranes, but for example, we have geotextiles, geogrids, and also geocomposites, which are essentially the, the union of more than one uh, geosynthetic or even a geosynthetic with another material. So for example, geocomposites that are used under geomembranes, the so-called geosynthetic clay liners. So GCLs have a very particular um, characteristic that once uh, the bentonite gets in touch with moisture, it swells and it would create a sealing barrier. So it is usually uh, designed to act as a second barrier of containment for the leachate. But the geocomposites are not only done with bentonite. There are several other materials that can be created on the same using the same technology. So, so there are several different types of geocomposites. For example, a uh, geocomposite that is able to absorb oil and petrochemicals, which is a non-woven absorbent that is in between two layers of geotextile. We can also use activated carbon, uh, order catching absorbents for heavy metals, for example, uh, and also uh, specific particles uh, uh, to absorb PFAS. So for example, an iron exchange resin or activated carbon. And of course, each of one of those uh, geocomposites, they can be used in different applications. So the, the number of applications that we can uh, apply geocomposites is almost infinite. But also there's a catch there. So for example, activated carbon can be used uh, widely and has been used widely for several applications. But we need to be very careful on where we're going to use these materials. So for example, if we're going to have um, hydrocarbons like PAH or TVCs, it's very commonly used, uh, uh, it's very common practice to use activated carbon. However, uh, for PFAS, it, the scenario is slightly different. So for example, there are some recent studies showing that the use of activated carbon for PFAS containment is not a final and ideal solution. Uh, as you can see on the shot on the left-hand side, on the initial concentrations uh, before passing the leachate through this, this uh, geocomposite with bentonite and activated carbon, the concentration of PFOS was lower than afterwards. So essentially what happened is after the material passed through this uh, geocomposite with uh, bentonite and activated carbon, the PFOS uh, concentration spiked to 4,000 nanograms per liter. It's roughly 200 times more than the original concentrated on the leachate. If we have this spike, it, it would essentially deem this material to fail on the length fuel criteria uh, for a single, single composite liner. The main reason uh, that this is uh, uh, happening is that the PFAS that is coming through uh, this geocomposite on, from the leachate uh, is essentially stopping on the activated carbon and the activated carbon is allowing 
the PFAS to degradate into smaller particles or more complex particles in the case of PFOS. So essentially, larger, uh, a longer chain PFAS will stop in the activated carbon and then break through uh, to PFOS, which is the one of the most harmful and the most regulated uh, compounds of PFAS in Australia and in the world. So essentially, using activated carbon for all the reasons, it's not the ideal solution. Um, we're going to touch on, on activated carbon a little bit further, but I just want to highlight as well, on the same concentrations, that would uh, the 4,000 nanograms per liter is equivalent to 4,000 micrograms uh, per liter. Uh, it would still be uh, acceptable on the leachate for double composite liners, which is, of course, extremely way more complex and cost costly than traditional uh, single composite liner. And even if we accept the fact that this is acceptable, what is the cost, the environmental cost, the CO2 emissions that we have when we still uh, guide or, or, or contaminated waste and soils into landfills? Why can't we find a different solution that we can treat the material in on site without having to do all the extraction and trans extraction and transport? So now if we start comparing uh, activated carbon to other compounds that can also be used in geocomposites, uh, once we look into activated carbon and zeolite, for example, on the first chart on the top, you have activated carbon and the absorption of PFOA and PFOS. And at the bottom, we have zeolite on the same, with the same absorption of these uh, PFAS compounds. On the, first, on, the on the first chart on the left, you can see the plateau on the absorption of PFAS, uh, getting extremely high concentrations of 97.9%. And the second as well has extremely high absorption. With the zeolite on the first chart, you can see that they use a massive quantity of zeolite in comparison to the activated carbon. So in, because of this, we don't create this curve as essentially a flat line where everything was absorbed essentially. On the second uh, curve, B, you can see the plateau forming because the quantity used was extremely lower in comparison to the, the previous one. And then we can create the same train, the same lines, the inactivated carbon. But this is only talking about absorption, not desorption. So we need to take in consideration the desorption. On the absorption, both of them have extremely high capacity. But when we plot the charts for the desorption, there's uh, interesting facts happening. So on activated carbon, when we add methanol to the solution where we had the activated carbon absorbing uh, PFAS compounds, we can start very easily to see uh, the desorption of these compounds uh, coming out of the activated carbon. With the zeolite or different compound, for example, uh, we don't have the same desorption happening in the frequency. So what happened is the desorption on the zeolite is not dependent on polarity, just like in activated carbon. This indicates that the connection with zeolite is done by ion exchange or a stronger connection than what we have with activated carbon. For this reason, uh, uh, ion exchange connections are way more efficient than activated carbon to retain PFAS and to reduce or try to eliminate the desorption. If we compare them, uh, uh, activated carbon and modified resins with ion exchange, for example, we can achieve more than 99% absorption depending on the concentrations that we have on the leachate. And the capacity as well uh, is way higher, in the range of 8 to 20 times higher than activated carbon, reaching up to 7,000 micrograms per gram of resin. The velocity as well is an extre extremely important factor uh, where we have all the the, the reaction happening with the ion exchange uh, resin in less than three minutes uh, and the desorption that is virtually eliminated because it's usually under any detection level limit. If we apply extremely high flow or high stream as we have on the left hand chart, we can easily see right at the beginning on the last 10 minutes or five minutes, we have the, the the whole absorption happening for the main compounds. So these two tests were done with the seven, eight main compounds that we have uh, contaminations in Australia, and we can uh, identify that all of them were 
easily absorbed in the very first minutes of contact. The desorption as well has shown extremely uh, an excellent results um, with minimal desorption or under any detection level limits showing the capacity to be, to be in this particular case 70 times more effective than intermediate carbon. Looking into each compound now on the desorption level after two months or on the first contact with DFAS, we tested the resin with ion exchange and you can see the PFOS and PFOA and PFHSS, uh, all of them had a desorption under any detection level limits, which show the extremely uh, strong bonding that this material can uh, provide when in contact with DFAS molecules. If we start talking into how can we use this technology, how can we use the geocomposites into our real world and into the, the practical side of it, uh, the main goal is to transform contaminated soil into a valuable resource. Instead of taking this material out to be disposed or treated or remediated out of the, the site, we can create structures in the contaminated soil by simply wrapping them with this composite that it's able to filtrate and bind the PFAS uh, permanently. So for example, one simple structure in the shape of a, a stockpile or a pad that you can use or uh, uh, introduce contaminated soil on top of it to retain the contamination within it. And you can build new structures on top of it. One other application as well that is very common is use the, the runoff uh, from roads or, or, or other structures uh, to be guided through a system that will be treating this contamination. We have cases uh, like this, especially in Europe, where we use geocomposite on side road uh, drainage to do the first passage or the first clean before this gets into the drainage system. So for example, you can see on the right hand side, the, the plume or the dead weight coming out of the road before and after passing to a simple geocomposite. Also, it's very important to notice uh, uh, the reduction, the drastic reduction in, in hydrocarbons and heavy metals that we are able to achieve simply by using geocomposites that have like a few turn, uh, to, to this uh, first remediation. And for PFAS, is essentially exactly the same concept where we will be able to absorb PFAS uh, uh, right from the, the first contact from the roads. Stormwater remediation tanks are also a very practical solution. We can use them to retain the weight that is contaminated with uh, PFAS or other contaminants by simply wrapping the plastic crates uh, with the geotextile or, or the geocomposite in this case. We can allow the weight to be treated before it's discharged to the groundwater system, at the groundwater or to the drainage system. So essentially we can use in two different or combine these two different applications. The first one is use the geocomposite directly in contact with the crates, which would allow the geocomposite to absorb the contaminants directly from inside the crate. Or we can use them uh, as a second layer of protection, uh, for example, after a geomembrane, where we would have uh, uh, the geocomposite acting as a second barrier of containment in case you have any failure on the geomembrane, for example. On supercoarse capping, it's extremely effective to use geocomposites, uh, especially when we compare to other solutions. So for example, if we use the traditional dredging and, and management, uh, we have extremely high risks to disperse the contamination around the area. So for example, if you look on the chart on the left hand side, uh, once we use other solutions like capping or simply AC uh, activated carbon placement, we can decrease this risk drastically uh, by simply using other solutions. So this is something that needs to be all, always considered uh, for this type of applications. Uh, and one classic example of this application uh, here in Australia, is done in was done in Sydney where we use activated carbon on a geocomposite to cap uh, sediments that were contaminated with hydrocarbons uh, like TVTs and uh, PAX. Um, and the use of the geocomposite was crucial because we were able to reduce any spread of the contaminants. So once the, the material was placed, the, the geocomposite was placed on the right position, 
a sinking frame, a steel sinking frame was used to hold the material down and then a ballast layer was placed on top to maintain the, the geocomposite in place for the treatment. So as this example, um, the geocomposite with a double carbon was placed on the shore bed of this river and we managed to contain all the contaminants coming uh, from the sediments through the river, uh, through the groundwater. So essentially all the groundwater passing through the sediments would bring up the contaminants and they will be absorbed on the activated carbon geocomposite. Uh, oh, this this project was received so many awards that is it's even hard to mention all of them, but including the project of the year and the best sustainable project uh, of the year as well. So showing that this is definitely a practice that should be uh, spread all over Australia and the world. So the main message, and to recap and conclude this presentation, for each project. Uh, we have one application and one solution. It's really hard to use one a silver bullet for all the alternatives, all the problems that we have. We need to uh, decide what are the best, what is the best alternative depending on the site conditions and situations that we have. Traditional solutions like landfilling may not be the ideal ones. So we need to, for new harmful contaminants, we need to find new solutions. And we learned this in the past with asbestos and other contaminants that we need to find new alternatives to be able to treat them efficiently. And, and absorption is extremely good, of course, but desorption is even better. So it doesn't mean much if we can absorb a contaminant, but the retention is only uh, temporary. And after we would have a desorption or even uh, the degradation of original compounds into worse compounds. So this is something that we need to always be careful when we are planning the, the, the capping or the remediation with PFAS. Geomembranes and PFAS aren't best friends. Uh, we've seen already studies showing that PFAS would essentially diffuse through geomembranes. So it's important to, to be careful when we are considering landfilling PFAS contaminated soils or waste that we find the ideal concentrations uh, if we need to stabilize or do other treatments prior. It just needs to be considered on the overall cost of the project and the effectiveness of the solution. Activated carbon is good, granular activated carbon is good, but not ideal, not perfect for all the situations. There are cases where, has, uh, as we saw earlier in this presentation, there are cases where PFAS can degradate within, after being in touch with activated carbon for a period of time and create a more harmful contaminant. So we need to be very uh, uh, alert on, on when and how are we using the activated carbon. The iron exchange bond with PFAS is something that might be one of the alternatives for the future. It creates a very strong bond with this uh, compounds and the desorption is virtually eliminated. So this is one very important fact considering that PFAS are so-called forever, forever chemicals and it would take a very long time to get rid of them. So we need to be very careful on what solutions are we providing to the environment. Well, thank you all for your attention. I will always be available if you have any questions or if you want to get in touch and have a little bit of a chat about PFAS, I'm always looking forward to. Uh, please save my contact for the future if you want to. And thank you all. Well, thank you, Gus. It's now you, our audience's turn to get involved. So please ask our speakers your questions via the chat box and don't forget to let me know who your question is directed to. Now, we did actually receive some questions from you, our audience, while registering for today's webinar. So what I thought I might do is kick off with some of those questions uh, to our panel. So the first question I might um, ask, I might direct this one to you, Boyd, being that you've had a bit of a rest since uh, Gus has been talking. So this question's come through from Algis from New South Wales. So thank you, Algis. Um, and his question was, various PFAS compounds are present in many products used, as, used daily, like Teflon coated cookware and lipstick. Are the dangers of PFAS overblown? If the components are that bad, why is it still allowed in everyday products? Okay. Um, 
I like parallels, so we're, we'll do a parallel here with uh, mm -hmm. cigarettes. Um, you smoke one cigarette, it's not going to kill you, but you continue to smoke cigarettes over your entire life, and you're probably going to eventually get lung cancer. Um, PFAS is, is similar in that way, um, but as, as Gus just mentioned in his closing, the PFAS sticks around forever. Um, so it bioaccumulates and you get concentrations that are, that are higher. Um, you know, I, uh, there are some useful, um, end uses for this stuff. Um, you know, Gus mentioned the fire that was, it was put out with the anti-firefighting foams. Um, it is a tremendous fire suppressant. And, and if I had my, you know, governmental information in a, a server room and wanted to set up a, a fire suppression system for that server room, I'd probably use PFAS. Um, so there's some useful uses for it. Uh, the problem is, as human beings, we've put it in everything everywhere. I mean, it, it, you know, I listed all the, the places there and, and many of those are not critical. You know, PFAS, uh, some manufacturers put PFAS in popcorn bags so that the popcorn kernels, when you microwave your popcorn, wouldn't stick to the side of the bag. Um, that is not an essential use. I'm sorry. Uh, so we need to be a little more careful with what we do with this stuff um, because, you know, we're still learning what the long-term effects are. And, and uh, again, looking at the chemical structure, they're not good. We, we know this. Thank you. Thanks for that, Boyd. Um, Gus, I, I have a question which came in from Robert Porter, and his question was, how do you seek to manage short-chain short PFAS compounds when regulatory requirements focus on, now I'm thinking I'm pronouncing this right, PFOS, um, then PFOA and PFH, PFH. I'm sure I have so not many acronyms, that isn't correctly, it? <laughs> but my apologies. Yeah, too many acronyms, you lot. <laughs> no, that's perfect. No, it's a very important question. Uh, I think Robert got right to the point. Currently, the, the regulations are focusing more on PFOA, PFOS, uh, and other similar compounds. But um, just like Boyd said, the umbrella that we have for PFAS, we have more than probably 9,000 compounds. So it's really hard to create one single rule that will rule them all. So I, we really believe that in the future, uh, the regulation will, will have to be a little bit more restrict uh, and to, to cover all these different compounds. In this particular case is uh, where we are only looking into a, a mid to, to long chain PFAS like PFOA, PFOS. Uh, it's very important to consider uh, side effects and and the breakthrough from these large molecules into small smaller uh, compounds. So the use of absorption uh, or remediation solutions that are able to absorb different compounds is is what I believe uh, to be the, the key factor there. Uh, as I mentioned, activated carbon can be very useful for different applications, stabilization, uh, and treatments, but uh, we need to have some kind of security level uh, and use different compounds. Like one example is the iron exchange or zeolites as well uh, that are able to bind um, other compounds, the smaller compounds. And not only the shorts, but now we uh, start talking about the ultra shorts, uh, which again is one new variation on the PFAS size and the complexity. Uh, so I think we are... Well, Boyd said we are on the forefront and trying to regulate uh, PFAS around the world, but I think that we still have a, a long way to go trying to not only understand the impacts that PFAS can have on humans and animals, but also which compounds should we focus into and in the, the threshold levels that we have. Awesome. Thanks, Gus. Um, Tian sent through a, a question live, so thank you, Tian, for, for watching today. Um, now, Boyd, I think this one might be for you. It was, how do you measure, because I know you spoke about um, parts per trillion in your presentation, and, and Tian's, I think, asking around, like, how do you actually measure PFAS when the values are down to parts per trillion? Also, PFAS remediation equipment that I have seen are made of materials that themselves contain released PFAS. So what materials are compatible? Uh, 
Um, measurement is very difficult uh, because of your because you're in the parts per trillion range. Um, the technique is is liquid chromatography combined with mass spectros mass spectroscopy. Um, it you know it's it's a reliable technique. Uh, the difference being you're measuring instead of parts per million or even parts per billion as we normally do with other things, you're down in the parts per trillion range. Um, and and this is um, more a political and regulatory event than a, a testing event. Um, you know, you have to take some special care when testing. I would recommend using accredited laboratories. Um, you know, for example, T PFAS is closely chemically related to Teflon. Um, you can't use a piece of apparatus that has Teflon seals in it or you'll get false positives for PFAS. Um, so it's, it's, it's very tricky. Um, but again, all this is driven by the fact that, that the governmental and regulatory folks have said, okay, we want to reduce this down below hundreds of parts per trillion. Um, that's, that's driving a lot of this whole thing. Uh, Excellent. Thank you. Now, Gus, I've got a couple of questions which have come through for you. So um, I might uh, ask a couple in a row to you. So I hope you're ready. The first one was, how can you determine the lifespan of a geocomposite used to treat PFAS? Perfect. Yeah, it's a very common one. <laughs> so uh, essentially <laughs> what we do uh, to, to create a, a comparison or try to determine what is the lifespan that we will we could expect from that product is to do a mass balance in between what are the concentration levels and the volume of uh, contaminants that we have on a soil or on a, or on a uh, liquid at weight phase. And then we do the calculation based on what are, what are the performance expected uh, from these materials. Of course, each compound, each leachate or eluate, each contamination is different. So the concentrations uh, um, will differ from usual tests done in laboratory. So it's always important to do some kind of trial or test with the material itself, not only rely on previous data, because uh, the molecules of PFAS, the, the, the species of PFAS in, uh, in a liquid concentration, for example, they will uh, behave and compete in between them for, uh, so, during the absorption in ion exchange or activated carbon. So it's important to, to try to validate uh, previous results with side trials or, or tests with the exact material that you have uh, to create a, a, a more accurate um, determination on what is the lifespan or the capacity that will be reached for the, the resin or for the geocomposite itself. Excellent. Thanks, Gus. Um, I so I'll jump straight into the next question for you. And this one's come through from Deb, who's watching live today. So big hello to Deb. Um, now, the question was, how would the road authority know when to replace the geocomposite on road shoulders? Um, is it just a time figure or are there any indicators? So potentially what you've just kind of answered, but specifically with regards to the example that you had around the road authority. Yes, no, exactly. Uh, this is very common uh, um, question, trying to determine what is the, the total capacity or how long can we use the materials for. So yes, there are a few indications that can be used. Uh, there are uh, materials that are slightly different from each other, geocomposites that are slightly different from each other. In this example that I mentioned on the, the roads uh, used to capture the majority uh, is focused on on uh, petrochemicals or oil, diesel that comes from the runoff. This particular material, uh, this geocomposite, it would absorb up to seven t uh, seven liters of oil uh, per square meter. So essentially, we can calculate based on the concentrations. We can have mass balance and plan ahead how long this will take to absorb. Um, on this particular case, on this project example, there will have been uh, uh, studies done. So they were collecting uh, the um, the weight before and after passing through the material. So we were able to trace whenever we start to have a breakthrough. And one more indication in this particular material, uh, it becomes in, uh, reduced the permeability along the way. So the more oil uh, or diesel it absorbs, it will start to reduce the um, the permeability so you can start noticing uh, when it start to get close to the full capacity being absorbed other materials are usually uh, permeable so for example the pfas activated carbon uh, 
uh, they are permeable to to liquids and only would bind the contaminants. So essentially, uh, test before and after uh, uh, the the passing through. It's it's essential to consider uh, when you're getting close to a breakthrough. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Gus. Boyd, I'll bring you Can back into the conversation. Oh, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just let me make a, a comment on the, the last question for Gus. Um, you know, a lot of uh, this is a standard question. How long does this stuff last? Um, and the answer is, is usually a really long time and we can get into specifics. But um, as unsexy as it sounds, care and maintenance is, is a lot of this. You know, people want to people want engineers to make them a solution that'll last forever. Um, well, you know, you put a new roof on your house, you don't expect the roof on your house to last forever. You know that after 15, 20, 30 years, you're going to have to go back and do something else with it and maintain it. Um, and similarly with these these earthen structures, you know, there's there's nothing that exists that solves this problem forever and makes it go away. Um, you, you're going to have to do care, maintenance, preventive maintenance, monitoring, as, as Gus said, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a long-term obligation. Oh, yeah, exactly. uh, just exactly. to one we'll comma on that, of course, we keep on in mind the numbers, but uh, it's important to highlight. So, for example, this example that I gave, they have been absorbing uh, hydrocarbons and, and other contaminants for 13 years now. So it's been uh, quite a while uh, before any kind of intervention or maintenance. Uh, but just like Boyd said, we, we usually think on the long figures of more than 100 years. So this is, of course, a long duration uh, material to be considered. Well, it's funny. It's one of the questions that came through from um, from registration. So it may have been addressed in, in the presentations, but it, it was like, why is PFAS contamination such an important issue only now? Um, so... I don't know if either of you want to comment on that, um, but yeah, that came through um, from registration. Well, there's, yeah, I'll, I'll hit that. There's a bunch of reasons from a bunch of different aspects. Um, from a, a chemical and biological reason, you know, it's not biodegradable. So it bioaccumulates uh, much like mercury does in fish and, and you get more and more concentrations over a long period of time. So that's a concern. Um, from the, the economic and, and legal aspect, people are suing each other over this stuff. You know, there, there's an economic motivation to uh, respond to these, these situations. Um, regulation is a proposed solution to that. Um, and, and from a, a general sustainability, you know, global planet health and safety, you know, I, I mentioned CFCs, I mentioned PCBs. Um, we as a human species are making things that the Earth's biology doesn't make and probably aren't a good thing to have around long term. There, there's, a, there's a reason the Earth doesn't have any organisms that manufacture PFAS. Um, so we need to, to manage that and uh, stop doing the stuff that we're doing that's, that's really, really, really bad for the planet. Definitely, totally agree with you, Boyd. Um, there was a question that came through, and I think, Gus, you'd be best suited to answer this one. Um, Fushi has sent it through, and his, the question was, testing absorption in field, um, how, well, can and how can it be done? Yes, there, there are some alternatives. If I have not explained um, that, that one properly. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there are a few alternatives. Of course, uh, uh, it's very common whenever we have, um, especially with PFAS, whenever we're doing some kind of treatment or remediation, we have control happening uh, irrespectively of what, what type of remediation is happening. So there's it's a very good indication, uh, especially when we have for on simplest case on, on a stockpile of contaminated soil, we can do control of this contaminant. Uh, the resins as well, depending uh, after the use, we can use uh, coupons under the, the, the stockpile uh, at the before and after passing through the, the geocomposite. So we can use coupons to extract um, samples and test them accordingly, trying to uh, identify any breakthrough or to identify if we are getting close to a breakthrough essentially. 
uh, we can use methanol uh, solutions to try to remove uh, PFAS uh, water contaminants from ion exchange. Uh, but mainly the idea is to try to create a control with a safety factor to have a, a, a compliant material for the full uh, time required uh, for the full concentration required to be treated, uh, creating a more safe environment for this application. Thanks, Gus. Boyd, I have a question which has come through from Benjamin. Um, he's here in Queensland. Uh, do you have any guidelines on how some of the more dominant PFAS chemicals move through various types of soils? Is there a difference between marine and freshwater environments on mobility? Um, okay, let me start with a caveat that this is not my specific <laughs> area of expertise. Um, but it fits in with with the measuring of you know the chromatography thing. They're, they're, the PFAS doesn't move on its own. It's not a volatile chemical. Um, but things that move along under groundwater and, and in marine environments push it, and it it kind of floats along like a nebulous little molecule. Uh, so you get this, you know, and that's the benefit of of, of the capping or the composite material is you, is you prevent the rain intrusion, you prevent the, the water intrusion into the system. Um, that's what moves it around generally, is, is water movement. And the PFAS kind of floats along like a, a non-participating, uh, you know, like, like an inner tube floating down the river, that sort of thing. <laughs> Good visual. So the next question I have is for Gus, um, and it is, are these geocomposites mentioned permeable? Yes and no. So there are uh, several different options. Uh, the geocomposites, the main ones that I mentioned, we find exchange resin and we activated carbon. These ones are permeable. Uh, there are others that just uh, like the example that I gave on the road to absorb uh, or petrochemicals. This particular one is the only one that would become less permeable along the way uh, until it reached the full capacity. But just as this example that I gave is 13 years of absorbing runoff uh, from roads and still performing with high permeability. Uh, so it, it takes a very long period of time into becoming permeable. If the application intended needs some kind of uh, control for the the surface water, for example, then uh, another materials should be used in conjunction, like, like geomembranes. Uh, but the main goal is to uh, use this compound, these geocomposites, as a, a permeable treatment, so you don't need to to deal with run with the surface water treatment or, or containment. Yeah, exactly. The ideal solution to this for, for pile storage, if you will, um, is to use a non, use something that contains the PFAS, absorbs the PFAS, but is permeable to everything else so that the liquid fl liquid water flows through. That way you don't have a, a, a set of contaminated liquid that you have to deal with and, and monitor and, dis and dispose of. That's, that's really complicated. Uh, much, much better to absorb the PFAS on a solid media um, and then when your pile is done and you finished using it, you can have a much more compact solution to deal with. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, a live question has just come through um, and it says, have evaporation bund solutions for the management of PFAS liquid by solar evaporation of the water been studied or implemented so far? So I'm not quite sure who best would be able to, to answer that one. Um, Not sure. I don't. I don't know that they've. Yeah, I don't know that they've done this sort of evaluation already. But I'll tell you. You know, the 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 thing I keep coming back to is these parts per trillion levels. Um, you're just not going to get. You know, that that works at a gross level, but at a parts per trillion level, it's it's just not conceivable. Um, you know, it it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, there are just to add on that there are a few uh, uh, tens a few uh, ideas on you trying to concentrate uh, uh, slower um, 
concentrate contaminants uh, in portions. So for example, if you have biosolids that are lower concentrations, using evaporation could uh, help concentrate the contaminants and then you can uh, treat them with one uh, uh, solution, one definitive solution. So essentially the idea would be with evaporation, in my opinion, I believe it will be created more concentrated with less mass. Uh, so reduce the mass to increase the concentration and treat less material. Even if, for example, in the worst case scenario, it needs to go for landfill disposal, you have less material to, to be disposed. Uh, but ideally, the, the idea of using evaporation or dewatering techniques would help a lot to increase the solid contents and then can be treated in on site uh, on a stockpile or, or wrapping with geocomposites, for example. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have come to our last question, so um, I might direct this one to, to Gus, and it's come through from Jason, so thanks Jason for your question today. And it is, what are the opportunity costs, so what benefits do we lose of dealing with PFAS contamination via destructive methods? Perfect. Yeah, currently the, the destructive method for PFAS is thermodestruction. Uh, not only the cost uh, that's very high for this type of solution, but uh, also it usually in, uh, includes some type of transport, uh, excavation and transport of contaminated waste or soil, or soil to the facilities. These facilities are not very common, so they're usually uh, not very close around. Uh, thermal destruction has been used for several other materials, but for PFAS in particular, uh, the thermal destruction of PFAS creates some nasty gases that are also needed to be uh, also need to be treated. So essentially, we are eliminating one problem but creating another one. Uh, these facilities usually use uh, high capacity filters to to treat these gases. But uh, it's a continuous cycle. So trying to to create a, a final solution could create more problems if we we keep doing this. So thermal destruction for PFAS, we can of course highlight the cost, the environmental impacts, and the CO two emissions related to transport and and uh, to until the facility and, and final destiny, final uh, disposal as well. So essentially. It's not a, a ideal solution when we look into all the environmental costs uh, that are related to it. Thanks. Well, look, I think that's all the time that we have for today. So please join me in once again thanking our speakers, Boyd Ramsey and Gus Martins for their time and input. I would also like to thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, Husker Australia, for their support with our webinar today. Now, if I could please ask for you all to complete the short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below. Um, by completing that, it does help us to improve and plan our future sessions for you. So finally, thank you again for joining us today and we hope to see you at our next Thought Leaders event. Good afternoon.